Okay. All right, so locally focused and sustainable fiber arts by me. Um, we can skip to the next slide, I think. So one of my main inspirations just in general is an author named Abra Burns. She wrote a book called Roughage, which, you know, side note, I highly recommend. And she says that she tries to buy local food as much as possible. The food is fresher. The farmers are selling directly. Um, and I am trying to read this quote and my thing is in the way, but uh, are generally farming more sustainably and get a price for their product. I also buy avocados because I love them despite not knowing who grew them. And this is a super important quote to me because I think when you start talking about buying locally um, or more sustainably or the environment, some people tend to get a little defensive. And so at no point during this presentation am I saying like, you are bad for buying anything. Um, fiber arts is fun. It's supposed to be fun. Um, and I love all fiber, no matter where it comes from, even if it's, you know, some merino that you don't know where it's from, or if it's a super local down the road alpaca farm. So I just wanted to start with that because it's important to remember that, you know, all fiber is good, all food is good. And with that, we can switch to the next slide. So my inspirations for knitting um, and specifically my kind of fiber arts journey, I'm gonna talk a lot about knitting today because that's the, the main type of fiber arts that I do. Um, but I am hoping that you can keep all sorts of fiber arts in mind um, today. So I started knitting socks um, in 2016 after uh, moving to Cincinnati and kind of finding my home in a local yarn store. Um, it was called Fibergé then. And as I was knitting socks, I started kind of doing this thing where if people went on vacation and they asked me to bring, you know, they wanted to bring something back for me, I would ask them to bring back wool from where they had been. So the um, pair of socks or the sock on the left is made from yarn from England. My parents brought it back for me. Um, and the socks on the right were from a friend visiting Italy. And I think it's a merino nylon blend. Um, and so that was kind of the beginnings of me buying local. Obviously it wasn't local to me, but it was this thought of like, a yarn and the yarn that you are knitting can connect to a place you've been or a place you're living. And that was super important for me, but it wasn't really the beginnings of my buy local journey. Um, that started more with food. So I was really into going to farmer's markets, buying food locally, trying to get my vegetables sourced as locally as possible, buying food within the season. And I think that's a concept that's a little more normal for people to think about versus buying fiber tends to be more, you know, you just buy the thing that's the softest and the squishiest and the prettiest. And there's, again, nothing wrong with that at all. But in the past couple of years, I've tried to start thinking about, you know, my local fiber shed, and we'll talk more about that. Um, so we can switch to the next slide. Um, I started really buying local fiber with a fleece. Um, his name is Cherry Pie. You can see him on the left. He's the cutest sheep ever. And um, I had gotten into spinning after knitting, as many people who do fiber arts might relate to. First comes knitting, and then you start spinning, and it all goes downhill from there. Um, so I had really wanted to buy a fleece. I had never bought a fleece before. Of course, it was during COVID, so I couldn't pick it out in person. But a shepherd that I followed on Instagram posted um, a bunch of fleeces and I picked one out because its name was Tim and I thought that was the cutest name of all time. And so I wanted that one, but the, the shepherd messaged me and she said, I followed you on Instagram. I know you're a spinner. You shouldn't buy Tim. He's not that great. Um, you should buy this other one. And so it was significantly more expensive, but I just did. Um, and I processed it in my, my driveway. That's my dog. And it was, I processed it in a baby pool. And it was an experience. I don't think I did a great job. It's pretty matted, but um, I'm working on it. I learned a couple things. And if you want to go to the next slide, I think I've got them listed out. Hopefully I put them in the right order. Yeah. So um, first of all, it really inspired this like personal relationship with wool. You know the name of the sheep your wool is coming from. It feels like this personal connection, even if you haven't met the sheep, when you get a picture of the sheep your wool is from, it suddenly like opens up this whole new world. Um, I don't know if I would buy many more fleeces. I'm sure I will at some point. It's kind of addicting once you do it, but it did help me learn a lot about the process that goes into wool um, or into a skein of yarn that you, you purchase. 
Um, I learned that I really hate carding, but I love spinning. Um, if any of you are spinners out there, you might relate to that, or maybe you love carding. But I learned that um, it's really hard. It's really hard. And you start to really appreciate, you know, why a hand spun, handmade wool costs way more. Um, I started thinking about how I wanted to know the names of the sheep that my future yarn was coming from. And so I started seeking out more wool that were directly from shepherds and for small farms. Um, and of course, that didn't mean that I stopped buying wool, you know, just anything on the internet, if there was a good sale, um, visiting my local yarn shop and buying like all of the squishy baby alpacas from Peru. But it just started to shift my perspective on the wool that I was buying and being a little bit more conscious of where that wool was coming from. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so as I said, this really started making me start to think about buying local more. And so taking a moment from my story, um, so buying local has, you know, it's an economic concept, um, it's an environmental concept, and it has a lot of different levels. So a couple of these levels are, you know, at its most basic, um, whenever possible, you purchase goods from local shops. And this can be either online or in person, but, you know, things that are within your area and there are different, you know, some people say 100 miles, some people say 50 miles, some people say, you know, places you can walk or bike to. But, you know, it reduces shipping costs, it reduces the environmental toll of shipping, and it supports local economies. So that's all important. Um, and uh, for knitters, you know, a lot of knitters will, or other fiber people, sorry, uh, will go to their local yarn store and they'll purchase yarn from there. And so that's a really great example of just a simple, easy way to buy a local. Um, next up is focusing on the goods that you're buying locally are also created locally. Oh, sorry. Can you go back? To, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> you're fine. Uh, so yeah, you know, you're buying wool from a local shop and um, that wool was made by a local, or it was dyed by a local dyer. So they're sourcing their yarn from somewhere else, but they're dyeing it. And so there's this one level that's local to that yarn. Um, and again, nothing is wrong, nothing is right, but it's just, it's thinking again about, okay, so instead of being dyed in a factory, it's being dyed by someone who really took the time and the artistry to put into this, this wool or this yarn. It doesn't have to be wool, it can be cotton, I apologize. Um, and then finally, there's this other level that I've really gotten into this year that the materials that are being dyed and the, mater the dyes themselves and the places they're being dyed, it's all super local. You know, it's the farm down the road that is growing the animals and is shearing them. And either they're going to a local farm or factory to be processed or they're being shipped off to be processed locally. The dyes themselves are grown. Um, I know the Dayton Fiber Shed has some really beautiful things. And there was a class in community, so community solutions about, you know, dyeing and or there will be, sorry, Rachel, I'm not sure if it's before or after mine, um, but about, you know, growing local dyes and over dyeing. And, and so it's, there's all of these different levels that local can be, and um, all of them are beautiful. And ironically, the yarn in this picture was not local. It's a cotton from who knows where, but um, it's a little bag that you can get vegetables from the farmer's market um, in, put them in. So, all right, next slide time. So I also wanted to talk about wool, and it's not really wool, it's wool and all plant-based fibers. So getting a, I'm going to try to stay away from the technicality of it because I'm not an expert, I'm not a scientist. Um, this is just something that I have read a lot about lately. Um, sustainability and buying local. So sustainability is um, all about what Community Solutions is about, and I'm no expert in it, but it's that the input toward a product, in our case, fiber, is, is, smaller, is smaller than the output. So, or is larger than the output? I'm apologizing. I'm not great at this. Long story short, your fiber is traceable. It is not hurting the environment. Thank you, Namita. Um, Namita Patel has said that Dayton Fiber Shed's natural dyeing class is um, coming up, and she has the registration link in the comments section. Um, so the product is traceable. And that's really important because it means that there isn't more energy expanded um, than goes into the creation of the, of the fiber. And a lot of fiber artists, including myself, when you, you start out knitting, you start out with acrylic yarn. 
Um, and it's great because it's washable. You can throw it in the washing machine. You can throw it in the washing machine a thousand times and it will just wear, you know, as normal garments do. Um, but it is made by melting poly compounds, which is a type of plastic together. And, you know, as many people have discussed, plastic ends up in landfills, it ends up in oceans, it doesn't degrade. And so that's one of the most amazing things about wool and plant-based fibers is if you have a sweater that you've worn to death and it's in pieces, you can actually throw it on the compost pile if it doesn't have any plastics or nylon in it. And it will actually just, you know, degrade and become part of the soil and you can use it in your garden. And sure, that takes a long time, but that's just so amazing to think about this whole process of wool or a cotton or a linen and how it can become part of the ecosystem once again. And so that's reasons why, you know, these locally grown fibers that come, become our fiber arts are just so important. Um, and it's a great to start thinking about, you know, the contents of the, the wool or the fiber or the, you know, cotton yarn that you're using to create something. Um, next slide, I'll stumble less over this one, I promise. It's less tech. So local is sustainable. Um, farms, are, you know, especially sheep farms or farms growing cotton, farms growing flax to make linen, they um, provide a large amount of green space. And the green space is a source for carbon emissions, CO2 to be sucked in, it creates more oxygen, it lessens greenhouse gases. And, you know, as many people have studied, greenhouse gases um, contribute to the, the raising of the global temperature, which is resulting in climate change, resulting in you know, ice caps melting, resulting in it's harder to farm when, you know, the global temperature is actually warmer. Um, so small farms, super important, super important for creating those green spaces, especially, you know, as more and more farms are turned into industry and housing developments and that kind of thing. So supporting our local farms can really benefit the environment in a very direct way. It keeps those farms functioning. Um, buying local also cuts back on the amount of resources expanded. It's sure, you know, a lot of local water is used to produce a local farm, but it also a lot of resources are used when products are shipped from overseas. You know, there are gases that are, you know, put out into the oceans, into the environment. Um, and so buying local really brings everything back to home. It contributes to the sustainability of your community and your area. And next slide. So my personal aha moment, I knew that local was important and I knew I wanted to do more local fiber, like the work that I had done with my cherry pie fleece, my sweater, um, which is what I was, I'm creating from the fleece that I purchased. But it felt like, you know, you can buy this local fleece, you can buy um, local yarn from a, from a, a farm, but it's kind of, you know, you can only make a sweater that you have to hand wash. It's not, it didn't seem like it was kind of a sustainable method for me because a lot of the clothing that I was wearing day to day, I wear things really hard. It needs to be washed super often. And a lot of wool, you have to be very delicate with. At least that was my perception. So in about halfway through 2020 this year, I heard about an organization called Shave Them to Save Them. It's put on by the Livestock Conservancy, and it's all about um, supporting local shepherds, not local shepherds, supporting small shepherds or big shepherds that are raising heritage breeds of sheep. And that, um, so consumers can directly support them and you can learn more about using heritage sheep breeds. I am really regretting not putting something about them on this page, but um, I'll have a link to it in my resources. and. The organization was doing these small challenges. They did one called a sock challenge where they were encouraging you to make socks with just 100%, you know, heritage sheep. There's no additives, no nylon, which is traditionally an added thing in socks to make them stretchier and stronger. Um, and previously I had thought that socks, you know, I had been in these groups in these classes where socks had to be 20% nylon. They really should be super wash wool. So when you wash them, they don't shrink at all. Um, and that was just, that was socks. That was the, the rules. Um, Keba Hitzman, she um, linked to the Livestock Conservancy, which is super wonderful if you want to look at that in the comments. And so I had seen on Facebook groups called Addicted to Sock Knitting, people 
had occasionally jumped on there and said, can I spin my own sock yarn? And the answer was always no, because it won't be that super wash. It won't have that nylon. Maybe you can spin it if you can really get it thin enough and you can spin nylon into it. Um, and so that was just, you know, it was like, okay, well, I'll knit sweaters from local yarn, but I'll continue knitting socks with this sort of super wash merino, 20% nylon. A lot of the time sock yarn is German um, and I'm not dissing the German sock yarn at all because it is amazing. It barely wears, it's wonderful. But my aha moment was in this shave them to save them um, challenge, uh, we were challenged to make socks with only heritage breeds. And they talked about certain heritage breeds um, are felt resistant. So Horn Dorset is a breed, uh, Tunis, I'm actually pronouncing that wrong. I've never heard someone say it out loud. Um, I should probably look that up at some point. It's T-U-N-I-S though. Um, both of these breeds are felt resistant. So you can wash them and they, they don't felt as much or if at all. So I purchased some yarn from Curio Fiber on Etsy um, and many other people spun their own yarn, which I'm really impressed by and I have yet to do. And I made a pair of socks and I've been wearing them and washing them about once a week and they haven't felt it at all, which for me was insane. Like it has to have fiber or nylon and it has to be a super wash, but these socks didn't. And so it really opened up the world for me of what else could I do with local fiber that I didn't think I could previously do? You know, could you just find the right fiber for the right project and really make a focus on local fiber? We can switch to the next slide. Um, and the next slide was, um, and Rachel, I'm happy to have you weigh in on this, but I was going to break it up for discussion and then go back to the slides and then have a following discussion. If people wanna write in the comments, if they wanna keep going and then do a discussion, I'm also happy to do that. Um, but I thought it would be a nice time to stop and have a discussion about what projects you've done so far. Um, and if um, we'll hold off on like your sources for local, your sources for sustainable yarn in the second part of this discussion. But I was hoping we could take a moment for other people to share maybe their moments of thinking about local yarn or projects they're currently working on, especially if they're with local yarn, but they really don't have to be. So if you'd like to write comments in the chat box, I will read them out loud for the people who are live and then um, can have a discussion that way. And I'll just start talking if people wanna write questions or if they just wanna write in the chat box that you wanna keep going. Um, so a project I've been working on is the cherry pie sweater. Um, so this is for my husband, um, it'll be his first sweater. It's, uh, you know, in the early stages. So we have the collar and two sleeves, no, actually not two sleeves. We've, um, we're getting ready to do the sleeves here. And now we're working on shaping the chest portion. It's actually inside out. I should turn it the right side. Um, and I haven't decided if I'm gonna dye it or leave it, but I figured I'll wait till the end, even though that's not normal. But it's, I thought it was gonna be white or gray and it's instead this lovely oatmeal color. So I'm very happy with it. Um, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, perfect. Um, I'm now seeing one. Uh, I think it's from Namita, and she completed a sweater with Shetland sheep from, sorry, is your name Keba or Keba? I'm so sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, from her farm. That is so wonderful. I have only completed one full sweater from Local Yarn, so I'm super impressed that you're on a second one. Um, someone sent a question to me. Um, so when you put a question, just make sure you send it to everyone. So don't, if it's private, um, the presenter won't be able to see it. But um, Nancy's question was, does wool include other natural fibers like alpaca and angora? Yeah, totally. So wool is anything, I think technically they can be called hair. I'm not sure the exact distinction. But from me, when I talk about wool, it's anything from angora, alpaca, goat, llama, um, bison. Um, supposedly you can spin dog hair even though it stinks. I have not yet tried to do that. Um, but yeah, anything wool. And then also I keep saying the word wool, but 
um, cotton, flax, um, nettle. There's so many different fibers that you can work from that are all natural and they are later compostable. Um, Liz says that she is a hobby knitter, mostly knitting socks or crochet figures like Pokemon. That's great. And she used to get her wool from a local shop, but sadly they closed last year. Liz, that's so sad. I'm really sorry. I hope you can find another local shop or possibly through this, you know, maybe find someone through Facebook or Instagram. Um, I have another question when you're ready. Yes. Um, so they said that they had some a mill spun with 20th nylon for socks and they raise alpacas and they asked if you've ever heard of alpaca socks without a blend um I haven't heard of them myself I I haven't used many alpaca socks because alpaca um to me personally the socks I've knit with alpaca they tend to stretch out over time and so I don't like them because in my shoes they kind of stretch out throughout the day I know other people love alpaca socks um, but I haven't done too much research into them myself. I've tried to stick with wools that they, they kind of hold their shape throughout the day. Um, the other option though, if you, yeah, someone, uh, Betsy just said, you can, instead of nylon, you can add silk for strength. And so that was um, a note that I have later is, you know, obviously local silk is a little more difficult to get, but it will um, degrade much faster than nylon if you're looking for sort of that option. Um, and just backing up to the comments, um, Karen says she'll be picking up a local fleece from a local mill really soon. I love that we have local mills. I did not know that. I need to look more into that. Um, COVID slowed down their processing or she'd be spinning it already. And she's um, excited to make some 100% local hats dyed with indigo thrown at the Weaver's Guild over the summer. The shepherd she bought the fleece from sold her herd. And so she's excited to learn of more sources. And we will be talking about that. Um, Anne-Marie says that she made some mittens from local wool and from them with tufts of dog hair. She is not worried about the smell. I respect you. Um, and she spun the mittens in the grease and washed them and washed them after they were knit up. That's really cool. Did they shrink, Anne-Marie, after you washed them up? Oh, nice. Um, Melissa Miller says she's mainly a hobby knitter for herself. Um, and just so you know, I'm also a hobby knitter. So that is wonderful. I have a full-time job that I do. Um, a hobby knitter for herself, but she owns her own fashion brand and is trying to incorporate more hand knit items. That's amazing. Source from local wools. Eventually she'd like to switch to all or most of her textiles to locally produce. That's really cool. Um, are you, uh, Melissa, focusing on like plant-based fibers like cotton and flax too? I know there's kind of a push to get more of that locally. And Edgewood Garden Studios, Betsy says, has offered some sock blends. She used fin and down breeds. That's great. I don't know much about fin and down breeds. I'd have to look into that. And Amory just soaked them gently. So yeah, that's another thing we're gonna talk about later. It seems like a big hump for people of getting over, you know, losing, using real wool, local wool that's not super washed is learning how to wash properly, which I mean, is a skill within itself. Um, but once you learn it, you got it. It's easy. Um, and Betsy says John I Arbin Fibers in Devon, UK makes a sock blend from their locals. Yeah, the picture of the socks um, that I shared at the very beginning, I think they were from Exeter, but it's near Devon. And I, I think a lot of the wool was from that local area. It's they're one of my favorite pairs of socks. Like they've worn so well. And Melissa says her plan is to use natural fibers as much as possible, including plant-based. That's amazing. Um, Heba says she started knitting socks and spinning and then bought sheep. So yeah, I'm on your path, Heba. <laughs> uh, she has Shetlands and added two Icelandics in the fall. Those are my two favorite breeds. Um, Cassandra says she started her fiber love while living in Maine. Luckily, it was with a shop that had so much local wool and yarn, including local dyed. And she loved to learn what what she can find here. Um, and she felt snowmen and soap and other little items. You're a beginner knitter and I'm making your first sock. Socks are the best. I love them and I need to get more felting. Um, and she doesn't have any good local wool currently, but would love to hear about where she can get some. She's in Chillicothe. Um, oh, Exeter is one of the large cities within Devon. See, I am terrible at geography, but that makes sense. Um, does anyone have any other questions or would you like to keep going? 
Anne-Marie has to rescue cats and she spins their fur. Wow, that's amazing. Is, oh, I did knit my sweater. Yeah, this is actually a Shetland sweater and I don't, the wool I got at the, um, it was a fiber festival in Kentucky and I don't exactly know where it was except for the wool on the arms because the white I ran out. And so then I bought so much trying to match the color. Don't recommend that, but yes when I knit myself. The Etsy shop for the Dorset horn wool was um, Fiber Curio. And yeah, so uh, Janet just said the wool gathering in Yellow Springs would probably have several local shepherds. And so that's a really great um, source. And we're actually gonna talk about sources in the next half of our presentation. So I think we'll probably jump into that um, because I think that's where the, the questions are going. and. Whenever Rachel is ready, we can jump back into sharing, but we can, perfect. So next slide when you're ready. So starting to think about local and sustainable. Um, I don't remember where this quote was. I remember I read it on the internet within the last week, but someone said it was about food, but it's not enough to just love local. You have to support it. Um, so many local shops and farms you know, they, they don't have a lot of backing or they're really working off of, you know, the direct sales. And so it's not enough to just talk about loving it or, you know, sharing things about it. You really have to support them um, with purchases. Um, and this is mostly, you know, things that I mentioned before, but one of the best things is, you know, it can be really frustrating to make a project and the wool or the cotton or the linen, it doesn't really work out for that project. Um, it's important to find materials that really work for what you're doing. You know, if you have local Shetland and then you try to make a summer t-shirt out of local Shetland, um, it's a great idea in theory, but it could end up being a little itchy or it's too warm. And so it's important to really find the right fiber for the project that you're doing and able for it to be able to kind of click with you. Um, and as Anne-Marie was talking about, one of the right things to do is just figure out the right way to wash what you're doing. Um, you know, there's this perception that, oh, wool is frustrating because it shrinks really easily. Um, but there's some really special soaps out there. One of them is called Soak, S-O-A-K, um, or even just like a very gentle, you know, you put it in a basin of water, you don't switch temperatures and you don't put it in the washing machine or the dryer. And a lot of washing machines these days even have a hand wash setting. Um, and so the key is just putting things over a line to dry, not you know putting them in a dryer. Um, one of the best ways to start thinking about local and sustainable is just paying attention to where your things are coming from, that traceability factor. Um, so, you know, it's totally fine again if you don't know where it is, but um, where it's coming from, but just you know, thinking about okay. This came from the UK, this came from Australia, this came from the United States, this came from California. Some of those thoughts can really start to kind of click into that whole local um, aspect when you're doing your fiber shopping. All right, next slide. Um, so one of the things that I talked about in the last was finding the right um, lease for their fiber and and just in the comments, someone says they use their uh, a lingerie bag when they wash their socks. That is such a great solution. Um, so the Spinner's Book of Fleece. Um, I know that sounds like it's for spinners, but this is an amazing book because it breaks wools down into categories of fine wool versus long wool. Um, there's four total categories in the book. And the book really talks about, okay, these are the fibers that are good for wearing close to your skin. You know, things like a headband that are gonna go against your forehead, which is a little more sensitive versus the, the fleeces or the, the wools that, you know, they have a high lanolin count. They're a little greasy, they're strong. They're really great for outer sweaters. You know, you wear layers, soft layers under them. Um, you know, a lot of those traditional Irish sweaters with all of the cables and stuff, they're more made from long wools. Um, and so getting to know the categories of wool, you can buy this book 
not just if you're a spinner, but, you know, just to learn about what kinds of wool or, you know, the internet has everything, just doing research on some, some wools are, are soft, some wools are rough. Alpaca is so, so soft. So it's a great option if, you know, you react to the itchiness of wool. Um, and it's, you know, way, way easier to find than something like cashmere, which is, you know, hard to find locally and sustainably. Um, so there's two methods to, to finding that right wool and substituting it for something that you're used to. And one of those options is to find a shepherd near you um, and just, you know, start making projects like that. So with cherry pie, I found a fleece that I wanted or I was told to get that fleece one or the other. Um, and it was, you know, it's a long wool, it's a Shetland, it has a really long staple. So each fiber is super long and it's got a little bit of itch to it. It's really greasy. So it's not necessarily something I want next to my skin, but it's going to make an amazing sweater to wear over a t-shirt on a cold day. That sweater will help keep you feeling warm when it's damp outside. Um, so that's one option. The second option is to find a shepherd with the breed you like. Um, and this is, you know, getting more and more easy with social media and other sources. Um, but it's, you know, if you want to, to find a local wool that has something really soft that's similar to Merino or is Merino, um, there are breeds that, you know, there are Merino breeders in the United States. There's several other American fine wool breeds like uh, Rommeldale CVM is one. It's very similar to Merino, but it was bred in the United States. Um, think in the mid 19th century. And it's, I mean, it's super soft. It's still kind of greasy, but it has more of that merino texture that I feel like merino is becoming more and more ubiquitous in clothing and fiber arts. All right, next slide. So learning to spin. This is not a learning to spin class. Don't feel like you need to learn to spin, but learning to spin does really help expand the amount of fiber that is available to you. Um, way more local shepherds seem to have fleeces or roving than yarn or, you know, yarn only in one amount. So learning to spin can allow you to, um, to once you, you're at a higher level, it's kind of hard to do, but, you know, to get the exact weight you want, the length you want, and expands the amount of options available. Um, so a couple tips for that. Uh, you know, you can search for roving or raw wool. So raw wool is just, it's been shaved right off the sheep. Um, if you're lucky, it's been skirted. So the little bits of hay and dirt and stuff have been pulled out of it. Um, when you get it, it smells so dirty and greasy and also wonderful. And if you have dogs or cats, they'll go crazy for it. Um, and so, yeah, you can buy a whole fleece directly off a shepherd. Um, and I'm not a shepherd. I can't speak to it. I know Keba is here with us today, perhaps some other shepherds. Um, I'm sure that's one of the easiest options for selling just because, you know, it's less work for yourself. Um, I also don't know that, so I shouldn't speak for, for shepherds, but, um, but that's a really easy option for buying local. Um, and classes are available through a lot of yarn stores, um, local fiber arts guilds. I'm not from Dayton, so I'm, I don't feel the need to, to give you a list of the stores in the area, but I know more and more spinning classes are being taught. And um, myself and people I know have also taken online courses through Craftsy, um, they're possibly, especially with COVID, there's more and more online options. Um, one of the advantages of a local fiber arts guild though, is they'll have practice wheels for you to practice on. So you don't have to invest in your own wheel. Um, also, there are numerous kits across the internet and Etsy that have a spindle and have a little bit of roving for you to practice on. So this is just a really great option. Um, for expanding the amount of available local wool to you, but also not necessary at all. You can find plenty of local yarns, threads, um, other fibers available without needing, needing to spin. Um, this is one of my wheels. Oh, the humble drop spindle. Yes. Yeah. So there's lots of kits. Um, I feel like, you know, more and more I go to local like arts fairs, like not wool related, just normal art fairs and people have spindle kits available. Um, the, the wool in this picture is from Sunburst Valley alpacas. Um, they're located about five minutes away from me in Cincinnati. And she sells kits on her website um, with alpaca and, um, and drop spindles. So lots of options available. If we can go to the next slide. 
Um, so I'm bad at talking about things that are other than knitting, but I figured I should mention them. Um, so crochet, obviously very similar to knitting in that, you know, you're using yarns, spinning, as we mentioned, um, and then dyeing is a really great way to either support local or to kind of take a generic yarn and make it a little more local, make it your own. Um, in the pictures here are some marigold flowers and then yarn that I dyed with the marigold flowers. So as you can see, it creates a really beautiful yellow. You can get colors all the way from like an olive green to a deep orange. Um, that deep orange has evaded me all this year, but I did get some really beautiful olive green. And that's my rabbit otter, who's my official model. Um, and I would love to hear, I know someone in the comments said that they use heddle looms. Um, there's just so many, weaving is another, a great fiber arts option. Um, so if you're a beginning fiber arts, you want to try something new or um, there's just so many options and there's so many ways you can incorporate local yarn into your fiber arts. So love to hear, you know, what other people work on too at the end of, kind of, end of our discussion today. Um, so we can go to the next slide. So this is what we were talking about before, um, how to find local fiber art materials. And I debated on putting a page with a bunch of links in this, um, this PowerPoint, but I decided it'd be better to send out a follow-up of you know, links. But there are so many sources out there. So I thought I would just slowly start talking through those. Um, the first is Fiber Shed. So this is an organization. And um, if Namita would love to uh, do a comment with more details about it, I would love for her to do that. But Fiber Shed is an organization that um, really starts to look at, you know, the local stuff within your area. It's inspired by the word watershed. So, you know, within your radius, uh, what is available in terms of wool or um, I know flax has been a big discussion lately, which makes linen dyes, um, various artisans, and fiber shed can be found on both a local level. So there's a Dayton fiber shed. And then there's also the Rust Belt fiber shed, which is the Midwest area. And there's also the National fiber shed, um, which they're all linked to each other. Um, but they all have this focus on local wool, local dyes, local um, cotton and linen and all of that. So it's a really great way to start seeing what's in your area. Um, they have both websites and Facebook pages. Um, and so especially on that national Facebook page, they do a lot of linking to, to stuff on a national level of, you know, ways to start thinking more about uh, local yarn or dyes. They focus a lot on dyeing, it seems to me, which is great because I don't think about that enough. Um, Facebook pages and Instagram pages are a way that I've found a lot of local shepherds. And so for me, this is pretty easy. Perhaps it's more challenging for others. But um, one of the best ways is if you can follow farm pages. Um, I know, I think it's pronounced Inishfree. Sorry, you'll have to help me. Um, Kiba, if you want to link to your pages, feel free in the comment section. Um, but one of the best things that you can do is when you start following a farm page on social media, a lot of the times they will post other farm pages or link to other farms. And so that's a great trickle down way to start kind of following a lot of individual farms. And so when it's time for them to shear their sheep or when they have a lot of wool available or, you know, they're doing a sale or not a sale, they just have new things posted. It's a great way to directly work with shepherds. Um, and support them, especially with, you know, it's super easy to go to pages like Etsy, but Etsy has high fees, they can be difficult to work with. And so um, finding the actual farm pages or artisans, makers, sellers, finding their individual pages can be really beneficial to them and can help you kind of direct source your stuff. Um, one of the coolest things to do is, you know, they have an online sale, but if when COVID is over, you know, if you're able to go actually meet the sheep that your wool is coming from, it's one of the coolest feelings to, you know, get to actually meet the animals that you're making a sweater out of. Um, wool and Fiber Arts is a, is a really great Facebook page. I was introduced to recently, um, people post projects that they're working on, but also post items for sale. And um, while a lot of these pages are national, it's very easy to say, hey, I'm located in this area, what do you have within, you know, XYZ radius? So that's a great way. 
And then um, Shave Them to Save Them, or SE2SE, -SE, is the organization that I was previously talking about. Um, their goal is to bring heritage breeds of sheep back from the point of extinction. You know, as a culture, we've kind of gone to monoculture and we focus on the highest producing or the easiest to raise breeds, forgetting about ones with super unique characteristics. And so the it's a three-year grant project run by the Livestock Conservancy. Um, the Livestock Conservancy, uh, as part of Shave Them to Save Them, but also on their website, maintains a list that has, you can search by, I think it's by zip code or just the fiber you want, but it lists the contact information for individual uh, producers, makers, and shepherds. So that's an excellent way to, um, you know, if you're looking for something, especially in the heritage breed range, um, but also, you know, if you just want something local, it's a great way that's connected local shepherds. Um, I found a couple people in my area that I didn't know existed. There's a farm called Flock and Forage, Flock and Forge, located in Columbus, and I've gotten to go specifically pick out wool from them and meet their sheep. Um, my local wool is a website and or I think it's an organization. I'm not, I'm a little unclear about that, but they have a really great search function where you can type in your zip code and it puts out um, the shops in your area. I noticed in my Cincinnati area, there were quite a few missing, so it's not a be all end all, but um, it's a great way to start your search. And, you know, again, you know, once you find one person or one shop or organization, it really starts to spiral. Um, as someone mentioned, sheep and wool in person and virtual events this year, a lot of uh, sheep and wool gatherings and festivals have gone online with a two day sale. Um, so especially when COVID is hopefully over soon, these will be back. And it's just, if you haven't been to one, it's so fun. It's hundreds and hundreds of vendors with booths where they're selling their products. Um, and it's an amazing way to talk to, you know, people to, to get the cards and the names of businesses, um, usually within your area or like relative easy driving or shipping distance. Um, meet different breeds of sheep in person so you can really see what they look like or not just sheep. Um, I know Janet who's on here tried to convince me to buy an Angora rabbit at one we went to. Um, there's, you know, alpacas and it's a, just a really great opportunity. But even with COVID, some of these festivals are still happening. So if you can look up festivals in your area, sheep and wool festivals in your area, um, a lot of them have gone virtual and that's really wonderful. I know the one at Young's, which happens in September every year, it's the second weekend of September. It did not happen this year, which was super sad, but um, so many have, you know, they've created websites that have all of their vendors listed. Um, and the thing that I didn't put on here, which was ridiculous of me, was your local yarn store. Um, even if they're not currently carrying things that are local, which most of them are, um, so many local yarn stores are willing to get things in, or it's wonderful to start up a conversation of, you know, what, maybe they don't have the right audience now, but you can be the customer that creates the audience they need to sell local wool um, or create a connection. Perhaps they know shepherds. So just talking to your, you know, local yarn shop. Um, at the end of the day, I just wanted to mention that in terms of finding the best wool for your project, the best wool to dye on, et cetera, the best thing you can do is talk to your local yarn store or contact um, local shepherds and ask, okay, what is the best project for your sheep's wool? Or, you know, what can I make with your sheep's wool? Um, it's just so important. And it just, it really, to me, is the thing that makes this, this hobby and I think for most of us, it's a hobby. So full of joy is just really connecting with other people who do it, um, connecting with the people who make the things that we are making of, you know, making the wool that we're knitting um, or growing the sheep. So if you want to switch to the next slide, I think, yes, discussion part two. This is a little ironic um, because it's not local, but it is sustainable. Um, this is a local dyer that I've purchased yarn from. Um, her work is beautiful. Uh, it's um, knit and knit craft, knit and knit craft, or man, I can't pronounce it, knit and knit craftery. I'll put it on the resource link if you're interested. Um, but I wanted to start up an open discussion because I'm not an expert. I'm just someone who's super passionate um, about local and sustainable yarn. And so I really wanted to hear from everyone attending today and share recommendations and make this an open forum. So I will read questions 
Um, if people would like to post in the chat some their favorite places to shop in their areas, um, you know, that doesn't have to be physical. It could be your favorite online shop or your your shepherd that you've purchased yarn from your fleeces. Um, and people are posting, so I will open up those comments. Ooh. Um, local fiber processing, if you don't wanna wash your own fleece, um, America's Natural Fiber Works in Somerville, Ohio can do it for you. That is amazing. Um, the Kentucky Fiber Trail is a resource, lots of different farms with natural fibers. That's so wonderful. Um, does anyone recommend a guild? I know off the top of my head, um, the Weavers Guild, oh, Weavers Guild of Cincinnati, and then I think the there's also the Miami Valley um, Guild. I don't know much about it and I'm not part of it. So if someone knows the official name. And knittersreview.com has an extensive list of fiber events. That's great for finding festivals. That is wonderful. Um, I mentioned on a previous page, and I'll just keep talking if people want to keep posting in the chat. Um, Rebecca says she shops in her backyard. You're so lucky, Rebecca. Do you have sheep? Uh, the Grumpy Goat Experiment Farm in Dayton um, is a link and Ohio Alpaca Textiles. Rebecca has sheep. Um, the I-75 Yarn Call happens every year in late July to early August. This is an amazing event where it's like all of these yarn shops along the Highway 75, um, they open up and a lot of times they have special sales and deals and you can, you know, drive your route and visit as many shops as possible. Um, Karen says she has there are two local mills she's visited, Three Points in Sunman, Indiana, and Ohio Valley Natural Fibers in Sardinia. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Are great if you have a fleece and you don't want to process it. I will be doing that in the future. Or just buy yarn and ready to spin fiber from them. Um, Columbus area folks, uh, Von Strom Woolen Mill does a nice job on processing. This is, I did not know there were so many mills in our area. That is amazing. New Era Fiber in Gallatin, Tennessee is an awesome mill, especially for alpaca processing. I guess I should pause. Um, Rachel, are you, do you know if it's easy or anyone else who's a Zoom expert on linking uh, these links into something that we can send out after the class or should I do that? Yeah, we can save the chat um, and we'll make sure that that gets sent out to everyone too. Awesome, thank you. Um, Rebecca started working with local sheep farmers and getting wool and having it made into yarn to sell to knitters, but then coronavirus hit. That is awful. Rebecca, do you have a page that you're able to link to or something to share um, to, to sell to knitters directly? Um, Laura says in the north of England, they have a great event called Wool Fest. It's an inspiring place to buy fiber and sea sheep. That sounds amazing. Everyone should take a road trip plane trip there together. Um, Anne-Marie says she hunts at Salvation Army for sweaters of luxury yarn to deconstruct like cashmere and silk. That's a really great sustainable option. Um, she'll apply this yarn with hand spun signals. That's great. Rebecca is going to get a link to yarn she has able to sell or connect knitters with. Oh, so I was gonna talk about Instagram uh, for a second. Um, if you're on Instagram, a great way to search for local yarn is if you write hashtag, which is a pound sign, and then a breed name um, of a sheep, if there's a sheep that you're specifically looking for. Um, a lot of sellers will, will kind of hashtag um, yarn that they're selling with the, the breed names. So that's one of my techniques for searching for yarn if I'm searching for a specific breed. Um, Cassandra asks, does anyone have any favorite yarn shops? Um, and Rebecca says, uh, her link is the woollyworks.com. Um, and she needs to get the yarn she received from her mill. Um, my favorite yarn shops, um, I go to make do in Cincinnati, um, the, or it's called Hank. Um, do I go to any more? I think those are the two I mainly, I mainly frequent in Cincinnati. 
Nancy has a local yarn shop, twopointfarmalpacas.com. My big issue lately is I've been participating in this shave them to say them, it's not really an issue. And people are constantly posting um, four ounce amounts of fiber for sale. And it's a breed that I've never spun before. And so I get excited and immediately buy it. Um, but they're now stacked up in my craft room so high that it's gonna take me forever to work through them all. Um, Rebecca wonders if she can talk real quick because it's difficult to explain on the, in the chat. Okay, let me find her and give her unmute. There you go. Hi. <laughs> it might just be easier to explain. So I, uh, I have sheep and I learned to spin and I was like, great, I could do stuff with my own wool and then I was like oh my god I don't need all this wool what am I going to do with it so then I had it made into yarn and I sold out like in a month and I was like crap I need more wool or more sheep okay well that means more money more fencing more barn you know blah 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 so I decided to work with local farmers or producers and get their wool and you know spinners we all get to try a breed whatever we want. Oh, let's try that breed, whatever. But knitters don't get to do that. They can't just walk in the yarn shop and say, hey, I want to knit something with a Lincoln or a blah, 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 whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like, so I thought, well, I could do that. I could go get these breeds of, uh, you know, the sheep fleeces and then have it made into yarn and sell it to knitters. So that was my idea. And I actually bought, I don't know if any of you know Bonita's story, her and I forget her friend they were partners and they had died in the wool and they used to do all the fiber festivals and stuff for, in our area and uh anyway I bought all of their stock of their the wool that they had that wasn't processed and I skirted it all I had somebody help me and then I took it up to a Stonehenge fiber mill and while I was sitting there coronavirus happened and so it was delayed getting back to me but I got it back a couple months ago um, so I need to get it loaded up. I, I was like, well, how am I going to sell this yarn? Like there's coronavirus, there's no fiber festivals. How do we even, how do I do this without, you know, cause somebody wants to touch the yarn. Right. So I'm kind of stuck. So I, after the holidays, I'll get it all, all loaded. But <laughs> anyway, so that was, it was just easier to explain it that way than trying to text it all. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. And I'll just say for myself, I know I love to touch all of the wool um, and I've had to give that up to, to buying things, but it is kind of fun to almost, you know, put trust in another fiber artist and you're like, okay, this is what I'm planning on knitting. This is what I'm looking for in a yarn. This is the yardage that I want. You know, can you help me pick something out? Um, and I've had a lot of success in doing that. And I'm sure other fiber artists have had to do the same thing. Um, but I do know, um, I'm not the person to explain how to sell things online, but I, you know, other uh, shepherds or fiber artists have, have been selling successfully during COVID. So I'm sure there are some resources and solutions out there and perhaps you can connect with um, like Keba or something. Cause I think she's actively selling um, and create a solution. I think she's on the chat um, and linked her farm in the chat. So perhaps that can be a resource. Um, Namita says, it's amazing to hear about this win after the Dayton Fiber Shed Symposium. Symposium, thank you. And I know Namita has done like absolutely amazing work in the, the Dayton area, building up the local fiber shed. Um, Keba says the Wool and Fiber Arts Facebook page has been a great monthly sales and month long fiber education. And I know she told me about that and I recently got on it and it's amazing. You know, people post things for sale and they get snapped up so fast. It's, it's almost frustrating. You're like, you take a moment to step back and think about if you want to buy something and it's already been sold. Does anyone have any questions either for me or for anyone else in the group? I'm happy to kind of translate those over.
Um, and if anyone is looking or you, Rebecca, specifically um, have a put the Facebook page link for that wool and fiber arts Facebook page. Cassandra says this has been wonderful and she can't wait to check out new resources. I'm excited. I've learned about so many new resources. So this has just been great for me. And Namita says, thank you to me and Rachel. Well, thank you, Namita, for connecting us. I really appreciate you. Um, yes, we are going to email, um, I think it's email, correct, Rachel? Um, we're going to share the list of resources, both from this chat, and I also have um, a list that I didn't want to link in this, but I will be, be sharing out with uh, links to things like the Livestock Conservancy, um, my local wool. Um, Rebecca has linked in the chat for the, her website, uh, thewoollyworks.com. So I will send everyone after this the chat link, and this is a be this might be a couple of weeks. Um, it just depends when, um, you know, with the holidays and everything. But um, the plan is also this has also been recorded, so a recording of this will be sent to everyone when it's available on the Community Solutions website. But I'll I'll email that information out to you when it's ready, and we're also going to be sending just a nice resource list. The anything that was put into the chat will also be sent to you. Um, asks what plans we have to continue to connect. Um, I don't have a specific game plan. I'm kind of cobbling together resources. But one thing I would suggest, I know at least this chat is through Community Solutions located near Dayton. And Dayton Fiber Shed is just an invaluable resource. So that could be a really great way to connect with other fiber artists. Um, Namita, I don't know if you already linked to the Facebook page, but I know that's a great option if people are on Facebook. Um, Yes, the Dayton Fiber Shed Facebook page. And so that's easy to find. I think that's a really great way. And Namita, I don't know what the permissions are in terms of buying and selling, but at the very least, people are able to connect with one another through that. Um, also, on January 2nd, we have another Skillshare that's all about refreshing your wardrobe with natural dyes. Um, and another person from Dayton named Emma Jackson. So she's gonna be showing how to revive um, your clothing using things like onion skins and avocado skins. So it's also um, to help reduce food waste as well. And you can use your food waste for, for dying, natural dying purposes. So that'll also be free. And once again, that's on January 2nd. Um, and so, yeah, and then we're hoping for more folks to join us um, and, you know, teach their skills. So if you know anyone who you think would be an, an awesome person to share their skill sets with us, we'd be happy to hear and connect into with them. Well, um, I'm happy to keep answering questions. I know we have another 30 minutes or if people have gotten what they needed, um, I think we were able to end early or do we keep going and keep it open? Rachel, do you know what the best? It's up to you. If you feel like okay. anything, I'll let you close. Um, well, I'll stay up for a few more minutes if anyone has additional questions, but um, and Amita also linked to the uh, the natural dyes class registration link in the chat. Thank you, Namita. And Namita is once again proving what an invaluable resource she is. Yeah. Dating, dating fiber share. This workshop, as well as the next one, um, are both co-hosted by the Dayton Fiber Shed group, so. Anne Marie says, thank you to all who shared. Stay warm and happy knitting. Uh, Carol Freed came in late, but she appreciates the presentation. Thank you. And thank you. Um, and as Rachel said, Carol, it'll be available on the website, the Community Solutions website later on. Um, Rebecca linked to the Weavers Guild in Yellow Spring. So that's another great option for classes or connecting with others. Um, Larissa says, thank you. This was an eye opener. She didn't know how much there was in the activity there was in this area. I didn't either. It's super exciting. 
Um, I just want to note this. I mean, everything's kind of up in the air with COVID and everything. Um, we originally, this past year, we wanted to have, um, maybe it was even the year before, we were wanting to have a locally um, sourced, lo what is it? Sorry. It was a fashion show of locally sourced fiber. And that was going to be something that was co-hosted um, with Namita from um, the Dayton Fiber Shed Group. So, and that's something that, you know, I, I'm not sure if we're going to be moving online or first, so we're going to try to wait till it's in person in the far future, but that's going to be another fun thing to connect on. It's so fun. And hopefully you'll, you'll have to do that and share that. And I'm sure there's so many artists here that will participate. Um, Melissa says you should reach out to the Dayton Fashion Week. Um, and Carol says, thank you to Rebecca for mentioning Dyed in the Wool. It's a favorite. Um, if anyone has uh, favorite Dayton fiber shops um, in that area, Dayton, Yellow Springs, or even Columbus that you'd like to mention, I'm happy to read those out loud as well. I know I mentioned some of my favorite Cincinnati ones and I'm sure I even missed some if others are around. Rebecca says she has lots of wool that's in yarn form now, about 80 pounds. That's so much. So everyone connect with Rebecca who is looking for more local wool options. She's got it. <laughs> Um, Carissa at the Dayton Fashion Week and DEFI is opening a new store called Dayton Threads in the Dayton Mall. Um, so uh, Namita posted that if you'd like to connect with Namita uh, through her Dayton Fiber Shed page. That sounds like a great option. Rebecca um, mentioned Fiberworks in Beaver Creek. Um, I'm, they used to or they still do teach spinning classes and they have an amazing selection of wool and spinning equipment. Um, if you're an artist and you want to sell at that, um, that shop, uh, Dayton Threads, um, connect with Caressa through her Facebook page and farmers can sell wool there too. Or I didn't say wool. She didn't say wool. Farmers can sell too. So whatever they've got. Um, Keba says, if any of you spinners need roving, I have natural color Shetland roving. Um, a giant box got back from the mill a couple weeks ago. Um, and Keba uh, had linked her both Facebook and Instagram pages in the chat. So when the chat gets sent out, you can look for her there if you're interested in that option. Um, if Arlene doesn't have it, she will know where to find it also. I hope the people with those chats understand what that means. I think I missed that part. Um, I don't know how difficult this would be. I would say, since we have a little time left over, if anyone has kind of their personal story in terms of finding local or wants to talk about their, their farm, their yarn that they're selling, um, something they're passionate about. This could also be an opportunity for, for them to speak uh, like Rebecca did. Um, if you're interested, just post in the chat box and Rachel um, will unmute you. I just wanna make a quick shout out to Keba. She's been on the Skillshare series before and she was super lovely to hear from. And I'm super happy to see her again here. <laughs> yes, I was hoping you talk again. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I think Rachel's unmuted and then Nancy will talk about her alpacas. Here we go. Hi everybody, how you doing? <laughs> Am I on? Okay. Yeah, you are on. 
Okay, well, I am up in Miami County near Troy, little town of Pleasant Hill, and I have a 185 acre certified organic farm on which I do organic hay, organic corn, and I also raise Shetland sheep and kinder goats. Um, the Shetlands are, uh, like we've already mentioned, are a heritage breed and the comments keep popping up in front of me. Yeah. It's a little distracting there. <laughs> you can close the, the comments chat if that's helpful. Let me see if I can get, there we go. See if I can get out of there. So yeah, um, just like you were saying, I got into fiber. I wanted to knit my own socks. So I went out and got some yarn. Didn't like working with that, got better yarn. And then I discovered, hey, I can make my own yarn. So I started buying roving braids from a couple shops down in Dayton and then decided to actually, you know, I can make this myself. And I actually had raised sheep when I was in high school for 4-H. And so I had um, Corydales back then, um, got a few Corydales. They didn't work out. They were actually kind of for show sheep instead of pasture sheep, which actually does make a big difference. So I got into the Shetlands and haven't looked back. It's been fantastic. So they've got a lot of uh, nice wool. This was actually, speaking of knitting sweaters, knitting a shawl, I, it took years off of my life. I, I'm pretty sure it only took me a couple months to knit this thing. It's a wingspan shawl, so it's actually, Start there. I'm 5'4", so this is 5'4 across, all knit stitch, and then crocheted a border to it. And I, this was the shawl that never ended, I think. It just took forever to make it, but I love it. It was from the wool from one of my rams that I actually, it was the first fleece that I hand processed and decided after I had washed and done all that myself, I was going to find a mill to take it to because that was just way too much work. And it's like somebody said that they didn't realize that there were so many nice mills around here. Some of them are small and you have to look for them, but there's, and some of them are bigger like Ohio Valley down in Sardinia, I believe it is by Cincinnati. Um, but there's a lot of good places you can take your fleece to if you buy a raw fleece, which was mentioned. Yeah, that is actually for you as the fiber artist. That's going to be the cheapest way to go. Um, and if you want to process it yourself, that's great. If you want to send it to a mill to for them to turn into roving or they can take it straight into yarn as well. But yeah, this was from Sven. And as you can see, it's a natural gray. Lots of different modeling in there, but Shetland's a nice sturdy yarn. There are a lot of fine fleece Shetland that if you want to do to the more next to skin items, but my Shetland's right at the moment are giving me nice sturdy yarn and um, good for outerwear, hats, gloves, things like that. So yeah, I sell all the stuff that I grow. I actually shear the sheet myself and then send the the skirted fleeces off to America's Natural for them to turn into roving. And then I take it to the yarn stage and sell the roving and the yarn. I love it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was wonderful to hear from you. Um, and Nancy says she can talk about her alpacas, Rachel, if you want to put her on. Hi, I like your background photo. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay, thanks for the um, opportunity. So I have a herd of uh, 25 to 30 Surrey alpaca in Dry Ridge, Kentucky. Uh, I manage the whole farm uh, myself. Um, I do bring in a shearing crew every April because um, it's, it's hard work. So I admire anyone who does their own shearing. Um, I have most of my fleece processed into yarn. Um, I, so I have everything from 100% Surrey to different blends of uh, Surrey silk, Surrey wool, Surrey nylon. Um, I do my own dyeing. I'm just starting to play around with some natural dyes. Um, I have participated on the I-75 yarn crawl for five or six years now. Um, I wish someday that I could 
participate in the whole crawl because uh, I think the people who, uh, who, who do that have just a fantastic time visiting all the different places. So when you come here, you can see what I have. You can usually meet the animal that grew the fleece and, and where the yarn came from. Um, they like apples. Uh, people like to feed them apples. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, occasionally I have fleeces available. Um, Surrey yarn is um, not good for everything. And I think there was a point earlier about really knowing uh, what's the best use for your fiber or knowing what's the best fiber for your product or for your project. And um, things that are great for Surrey yarn are things like scarves and shawls and things that drape. So um, I am experimenting with some sock yarn. So um, hopefully I'll find some sock knitters who who can uh, give me some feedback on that. So um, again, thanks for, um, thanks for the opportunity. Nancy, someone was asking what the name of your farm is um, and if you have an online store. Yeah, it's um, Two Point Farm Alpacas. And um, I do have a website, it's twopointfarmalpacas.com. I have a little bit of my yarn listed on Etsy also, but, um, I have a lot of yarn that I haven't listed yet because I have a lot of yarn. Um, and so if you're interested in something, maybe get in touch with me. I can let you, know, you know, tell me what you're looking for. I might have it. I might be able to list it for you. So I have a lot of work to do to, uh, to get all my yarn um, online. Uh, the yarn crawl is usually how I sell most of it. Uh, you know, it's usually, it, it's in person. I have a small store, but um, it, it's on my list to get more yarn uh, on the on the websites. Well, thank you so much. And I'm a sock knitter. If you uh, need an extra person, I'm always down. Awesome. Is anyone else interested in talking about their sheep, their their wool, their store, or even just something that you're working on that you're really excited about? Um, if you're interested, put your name in the chat. Um, Keba is down to talk about, to explain wool and fiber arts. Um, again, if she can be unmuted. Yeah, it is a little bit confusing. Um, there's actually two wool and fiber arts sites. There's the page, which Facebook makes them um, set up to be able to have a group together. That one's only got maybe a couple thousand members. The one you want to go to if you want to be involved with the um, monthly sales, the live sales, is the group which has over 11,000 members. And what happens on Wool and Fiber Arts is there's, there's actually stuff going on all month long. The kind of, not really the focus, but the high point for most people is the monthly sale. I think it's usually the third or I think it's the last full weekend of each month. It's usually a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sometimes a Monday if it's like a holiday weekend or something like that. And what happens is those who are, it's a juried show. So those who have chosen as vendors, um, I've been a vendor before and I think of maybe a, I don't know if anybody else on here has or not, but the vendors will um, be assigned a half hour slot to do a live sale or to upload a video if they don't have a very good internet connection. And what happens is usually most people, they'll, they'll say, here's item number one, a um, two pound Shetland fleece, and it's gonna be $25. And then the first person to comment sold is the one who wins it. And then they go, to, and then they just keep going through their different items um, and that's, pretty much how it works, but the rest, that's only one weekend of the month. The rest of the month, there's a week dedicated to people who make fiber tools. So the spindle makers, um, the um, electric, there's a, a person on there that makes electric wheels, um, like a little travel portable one, um, whatever they might be making. So there's a week for people dedicate, for dedicated to people who make fiber tools to post up what they have. There's no selling the rest of the month outside of that one weekend, but there's the fiber tools weekend. There's the, or the fiber tools week. There's the um, teach me week, which if you do needle felting or spinning or weaving or whatever, you can get in and 
set up, take, take a little video and post it about what you do. Again, no selling, but just education. So there's stuff happening all month long. But if you want to if you want to be a vendor, there's information about how to get your name into that. Fill out the application, your pictures and stuff like that. Um, but if you want to just join the group to see what's going on, that's not a problem as well. They have a couple questions for you to answer, so make sure you do that. But that's that's wool and fiber arts. There's a lot going on and there's a lot of people and it's been fantastic for me since all the shows were canceled. I went through a lot of product, which I was I thought was fabulous. Of course, I also bought a lot of product from other vendors, so it kind of equals out. It's kind of like when you go to a fiber show and you're a vendor there, you usually bring home as much from other vendors as what you sell to other vendors and to the public as well. So, but it's a great website. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them for you. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone has questions, uh, Keva, just so you know, your sound went really quiet when you were talking for some reason. Um, I could hear you, but if anyone else, if there was something she missed and you want to put that in the chat. Sorry about that, I'm not sure. Oh, you're fine. Was. Okay. I, I'm at the end of the internet connection. Uh, so sometimes it gets a little flaky. So yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. <laughs> Um, so yeah, if anyone has any final questions, we can go over those and I think we'll aim to end in another, you know, five minutes or so. Um, Rebecca is here though. Hi again. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. We were out building something for the chicken coop. <laughs> oh, sorry, yours just popped up for some reason. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh, she commented um, saying that she could share how she's now a city girl, how she went from city girl to farming. Oh yeah, would you like to do that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm from Texas. We're a military family. My husband retired a couple of years ago and we decided to stay here. We love it here. So it's not hot all the time, yay. <laughs> I'd love the seasons because I, growing up in Texas, you don't see that. So anyway, I was a city girl. Uh, my cousins, they had, you know, they did the 4-H thing and all of that, but I never experienced any of that. I just saw it from a distance. And so when we decided to, move here we knew we were going to stay um so we bought this place we have 11 acres out in tip city and uh we're like oh well what are we gonna get we need some animals we can't just have all this land and no animals and my husband wanted fainting goats and i was like no we're not getting <laughs> well they would be cute but what are they going to give us so i said oh i know we can get sheep because at that time i had just started learning to knit and uh when we got here we've been here six years now so I started learning to knit and then I was like, oh, we can get sheep. I can learn to spin. Why not? <laughs> I'll just get some sheep and fling them out and, you know, it'll be fine. Whatever. Oh my God, was I so wrong. <laughs> it's not just fling them anywhere. <laughs> you have to learn to take care of them. Um, so I've learned a lot uh, going through the whole process of like I first learned to knit and then Arlene at Fiberworks taught me to spin. And then I guess a year later or so I got uh, the sheep and uh <clears throat> I got my sheep from Kentucky actually and uh, Sarah out at uh, Equinox Farms she I mean I would call her all the time oh my god I don't know what I'm doing uh, she's really been my mentor as far as taking care of the sheep but I've learned through like Ohio State County Extension I took classes sheep and goat classes from them I mean I've learned by using all of the resources that I could get to do what I'm doing now I mean, I, I'm amazed that I get to do this. I'm so excited that I get to raise sheep and now chickens and ducks. Um, <laughs> I want geese now. <laughs> um, but it's just been a great opportunity to learn as I go. I mean, you know, if I had to wait until, oh, I can't do anything until I know everything about how to do it. Like I could have taken classes and did all this. I would be 80 years old and then still not get what I want because I have to know everything first. So I just jumped in and I learned as I went. I made a lot of mistakes along the way, but I think by learning and failing and making mistakes, <laughs> you actually learn a lot by making mistakes <laughs> more than just knowing everything and getting it perfect the first time. So I don't know, it, it's been great. And if anybody ever thinks about doing something like that, just go for it. I mean, what are you gonna lose, right? Try it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It's just been a really exciting thing to do. 
Thank you for sharing. So, you're welcome. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, and we'll just, I'll read a couple more comments and then I think I'll turn it over to Rachel for ending comments. Um, Melissa says she grew up on an off the grid farm, left for the city at 20 and is slowly being pulled back into it. Um, she guides her fashion brand into local, a local and sustainable model. Um, Namita says, Melissa, that it's so amazing to see designers like you connect to the, connect the city to the farm through fashion. Totally agree. Um, Keva mentions, as she said, the high points of the wool and fiber arts group um, is a Facebook live sale one weekend a month. The rest of the days are dedicated to education, vendor highlights, like fiber tool makers, dyeing, felting, et cetera. Um, to make sure you join the official group, it's the one with 11,000 members. Um, just the page has um, only 2,500 um, to get all the excitement. And Melissa says that she learned knitting, crocheting, and sewing as a young girl, and so it's nice to use those skills. Um, thank you so much for everyone for being supportive and helping me through this. This is the first ever class I've taught, so thanks for being patient um, as I struggled through some parts of it. But um, I learned so much from all of you. Uh, Melissa also. If you have a site for your brand, uh, link it in the chat and we'll send that chat out. Um, but thank you for uh, the support from Namita and Dayton Fibershed and Community Solutions. So I'm going to turn it back over to Rachel to finish up. All right. Well, I just want to thank everyone for coming to learn and showing support. Um, and thank you, Asha, for being willing to share. I think you did an amazing job. And um, I hope to see you again later at our further Skillshares. All right, thank you everyone. Have a great weekend.